Hey Survivors, Makeshift here, and we're gonna go on another excursion south of the equator to talk to a few of the Aussies involved in the Pox Eclipse Festival that takes place deep in the bush. It's been a few years since we talked to the people of the Pox, and now that they've got two events notched on their belts and a brand new edition from the Mad Max saga coming real soon, I figure it's time for a catch up. From their website, Pox Eclipse is inspired by the extremely influential and impactful Mad Max films created by George Miller and Byron Kennedy. And the setting for this event is in the beautiful and historic gold mining town of Southern Cross in Western Australia, where the Red Desert starts around four hours from Perth. It takes place in October when there's mild, enjoyable weather and cool evenings conducive to fire pit storytelling and epic nights and days of dancing. Now, before we get started, I just want to remind you all that the patch of the month is in full swing now. So if you want to get in on that action and have a couple of caps to spare, head over to patreon.com slash the apocalypse post and sign up today. And without further ado, here's Pox Eclipse. What happened to you? We did this ourselves. They're coming. It can't be. Where is everyone? All right, survivors, I have three representatives of Australian's own Pox Eclipse with me today, and I'm going to introduce them one by one. Here we go. First off, the instigator, the director of Pox Eclipse. Welcome to the show. How are you? Great. Thanks for having me again, Makeshift. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on. Next up, we got Rouse About, who was in charge of the volunteers, which is always uh, hurting cats. Well, in this case, it's hurting feral <laughs> cats. <laughs> Welcome great to the show. Honor. Howdy. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Absolutely. And Storm, who uh, is a self-labeled punter, and I'm going to find out exactly what that means in Australian uh, right now. What the heck's a punter, Storm? Um, a, a punter is just like an audience member, like someone who comes and enjoys a show. Uh, that's just what we call it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel that. like, and not in this case, Storm, it can be also slightly condescending as well. The people who organize the events will, oh. you know, deem those participants who just come in and enjoy just punters. Yeah, this is, oh. I used to work okay. backstage for events, so this is self-proclaimed putting myself down to a punter. I, I was just okay. there. <laughs> okay, to be well, fair, you know, though, weren't you involved in a camp, Storm? I was. I, I, I did help a bit with the Red City, um, which was our group of mates um and oh, so you're not a my punter, mom then. no but that's what i call myself <laughs> <laughs> you, you're like you you want to keep it at arm's length you want to get too exactly. involved I, like yeah i'm, I'm being modest, very enigmatic right? storm <laughs> <laughs> exactly who me well awesome <laughs> i'm super excited to have you guys on because uh last time uh it was 2021 when we talked to uh, for the first time about Pox Eclipse back on the show. And unfortunately, the, the event got canceled that, this, that year. But now you've had two, is that right? Yeah, it's been two since then. So after the initial one got canceled, we ended up going out into the desert, just like uh, a small group of us and having this thing that we call Proto Pox Eclipse. Um, Proto Pox Eclipse, okay. Yeah, and that was interesting. It was a really cool little experiment. The council were kind of disappointed that we couldn't get out the queue because it's very remote. And so they uh -huh. gave us some money to bring some bands and stuff out. And it was, yeah, it was great. A lot of the guys with the cars came out and um, we did it on an old abandoned, I think it was a camel racing track. Really? So, yeah. So they were, like, this is seven and a half hours from Perth in a place called Q. Uh -huh. And when we did that, we just started sort of rethinking the logistics around having it there the next time around because oh, it's yeah. a long way. And um, we found another location in a place called Southern Cross, which is how many hours? Three and a half from Perth? Yeah, four, I think. I think. Four hours, which is a little bit All closer. Right, so you, so. Yeah, that helps out a lot. But um, getting out into the, that red dirt is kind of necessary from my point of view to have it mm. look how I want it to look. So. Wait, so you get some red dirt too? Because we've got red dirt through like... Arizona, New Mexico, some Texas. Uh, yeah. Is it real red dirt? Or is yeah, it just kind of like the old the old country uh, term of just being like, it's dirt that's far away? No, nah, it's the real red dirt that gets into all your cracks and yep. it doesn't come out of your car. Yeah. <laughs> yep, I know and, it and well. That one's, that one's actually on an abandoned speedway track as well. Uh, oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. So, that, so rather than racing camels this time, it's racing cars? Is that? 
Oh, the guys like to hit the track in their, their cars, yeah. Nice. And, and when they nice. do that, it kicks up a whole bunch of dust, which just blows over the entire gen pop area. And Oh, my God. Event I mean, that's just so. part of it, though, right? Oh, we love very it. Very yeah. 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 All right. So um, let's let's take it back. Tell me what Pox Eclipse, what was the intention of creating a new festival? Um, and, you know, kind of give it to me in my terms as a wastelander. Like, what did you guys borrow and what is different about Pox Eclipse? I think what I think we discussed this briefly in our, or maybe not briefly, it might have been at length in our last um, conversation, but I'm a huge Kennedy Miller fan. Like I've been obsessed with Mad Max and that post apocalyptic stuff since I was a kid. Like they used to play it on the GWN, Golden West Network was a television station that I had in a country town growing up and they used to play Mad okay. Max on there. And it was actually sort of like crushed in because they, they went from widescreen to four by three. So like Max was all elongated right. and stuff. It looked kind of cool. But, oh, funny. Um, I've been obsessed with Mad Max for years, like to the, to the point where I was, when it was on a hiatus for many years, I was writing prequels for it and stuff. I was excited about seeing more. Cool. Reading all the books and studies and, um, started going to Blazing Swan, which was like a, a Burning Man regional event in Western Australia. And so you meet a lot of like-minded people there. And I started talking to Ollie, a good friend of mine, about um, a couple of sort of underground events that were happening in Australia. Um, And because we like those kind of like more niche, unique, uh, low number type events. Yeah. That kind of, I guess you would say are a little bit, edgy or hardcore like there's stuff that goes on there that are, is kind of like you wouldn't see at other events right and i was aware of a few things um there's a group of artists um uh, survival research labs and i was really into what they used to do sort of like in the 80s and 90s and then um there was another event that they had in California, I can't remember the name of it right now. I'll get back to that when I remember it. Yeah, um, and then I knew about Wasteland Weekend as well. I didn't know much about it, but I knew that it was a Mad Max event. And mm-hmm. Ollie and I just started talking about these events. And we're like, we should do a Mad Max event. Like it's an Australian thing and there's not much going on in that area here. I mean, there's kind of conventions. There's Silver and Collective stuff, which is awesome. But I wanted a party, uh-huh. like a big party and... Um, so, and I, and I'd already been working in events for a long time, starting with the big day out. And I knew a lot, a lot of my friends were in bands and stuff like that. So we just cool. started sort of putting it out there and it sort of built up and it, from, from us conversing about it, at blazing swan to eventuating was like seven years of just like, you know, bringing it up, letting it go, bring it up, letting it go. Yeah. People coming in, talking about it, people leaving and talking about it. And- yeah. Cause it takes a while to like gain interest on something so niche right so you kind of have to like seed it out there and just make sure people are going to be interested yeah and i'm not sure if they are even (laughs) but but sometimes they're like hey that sounds cool uh but then the tickets go on sale and you're like hey does anyone anyone want one it's 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 definitely like these kinds of niche events are organic growth type situation and it has to find the audience like um people aren't going to start spilling into an event like this it's not popular sort of i think it's starting to happen a little bit now that we've done two years and there's photos getting out there and people are walking away going how that was a hell of a time right yeah i mean that's the biggest thing is is no one wants to commit it's tough to get people to commit to drive out into the desert four hours not knowing what they're in for right yeah so once you get the the proof of the pudding yeah desolation center desolation center that was the one i was trying to think about the, the other event. so uh, Oh, got uh, it. Yeah. And it was kind of like uh, Survival Research Labs attended that event and they and they started attracting people like Einstein, Zen, or Garten and oh, they cool. blew th- the blue stuff. It was extremely dangerous, but it's kind of like, it's kind of the shit that we kind of like. And just on that really quickly, like our event, there's kind of stuff going on at the moment that I would, that we need to start reining in a little bit. And I'm sure... <laughs> The thing is with, and I think I discussed this on your last cast, but in Australia, things are a little bit different to America as far as occupational health and safety and 
so it's it's getting pretty wild out there and we just need to start <laughs> running it a little, little bit like because as numbers increase um you know, it's still always going to be great fun but we have got yeah. liabilities and things like that. We've got to- oh yeah, of course. Like o- over the years, you know, like Wasteland had to um, institute their five mile an hour policy, which we didn't have in the earliest years um, for the cars driving around. And then they even had to extend that to like the, the, the cruise, the car cruise, which is just cars. Like there's no one really walking around at the car cruise, but they still have to keep that five miles an hour. Yeah. Um, so stuff like that kind of happens. The, the, the w- popularity comes with rules. Yeah. Do you know about um, the tire dragging thing at Wasteland Weekend? <laughs> With Dave Dufour? Yeah. So <laughs> so Firebird comes over to our show. Oh, yeah. And um, the first year that we ran it in Southern Cross, he decided that that was going to absolutely happen. And oh. without, without any sort of, you know, um, <laughs> communication or all of a sudden this guy was getting dragged around the side on a fucking tire behind a car. <laughs> And how did it go? How did it go? How many scrapes were there? No, he was fine. It was, it was okay, good. But um, he actually got pulled he, up by one of our rangers, and not like any of the event directors or anything. They just said, "What are you doing?" <laughs> <I'm getting trained. laughs> well, yeah, until there's a rule, it's me, not against the rules. <laughs> he propositioned me and said, "You know, can we can we take blurt out?" And I was like, "Oh, I'm meant to be setting an example here." <laughs> so like, next. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But, like, oh, seriously, the- I didn't really have an issue with it. Like, I know what the uh-huh. ground's like out there. There's nothing that's going to, like, go into his ass that I'm aware of out there. Oh, that's good. <laughs> oh, that's good. And, and if it did, yeah. it, w- it would be on him, you know, like, yeah. we're going to fly you out to Kalgoorlie we- Hospital. <laughs> yeah. We play juggers on it. We uh, can race tyres on it. Play j- – oh, that's funny. Um, all right, so what, what – are costumes mandatory? Like, is it immersive that, that way? Yeah. Well, that so 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 they're they're mandatory, and but we don't have enough staff to uh, enforce that at the gate. But we are working on that. So, like, I want to have mohawkers at the gate. um, Nice. And I want them to be just hassling people if they're not looking correct, and if they don't, then the because really the people that come four hours out to the event to go to the event, they have costumes, but it's more sort of. People that are just checking in. We do day passes for locals and they come in and oh, they're, cool. sometimes they're not, but they get a taste of what it's about. And I, I th- ultimately yeah. I think it's, they think it's completely weird, but they still have a good time. <laughs> I don't know why they would think that. <laughs> it's pretty fucking bizarre. I mean, yeah. just imagine Wasteland Weekend on a smaller scale, but with Australians. I mean, Australians are fucked. <laughs> this is what I've heard. I've heard this. I've known a few Australians. Uh, they're all fucked. You're right. <laughs> so, Southern Cross is a small country town. There's not a, a lot going on otherwise. So I'm sure it's quite the spectacle. Yeah. Yeah. Now, where are you guys from Silverton? Because they do the um, the Mad Max Museum. They get the Mad Max, what, every, every year they get together at the museum and do like a small festival. Are you guys close to that? Oh, I'm very, very good friends with Steve. Um, uh-huh. He who runs that show, the anniversary show. The, uh-huh. There's a bit of history with that show, which we won't go into, and it didn't sort of run every year for a little while, but uh-huh. um, he's an amazing individual. He's with the Dogs of War, as you probably know, and um, mm-hmm. meeting Steve for me was very important with everything that was going on with Pops Clips. Like he was just yeah. a massive inspiration and very positive and supportive. And um, I met him online and then when uh, Tyranny and I went to the Silverton Collective show, we met in the flesh and it was like, we're brothers. We're absolute brothers. You know, like we're mm-hmm. both obsessives and the amount of information and knowledge that they've got about that area up around Silverton and Broken Hill, him and Adrian was just amazing. Well, I went, I drove across another boy with tyranny for that one. And that was an amazing trip. And it's happening again this year. It's coming up very quickly, actually. Um, so we're going to head off early March for that show. And, uh, oh, wow. um, I can't wait. Uh, the Nullarbor is a very, very long drive. So it's kind of like, if you don't stop, it's two days kind of thing. Yeah. I think that's uh-huh. about how long it took. It wasn't it, tyranny. I think we had three hours sleep at the, in the Eucla and then, punch through um, it's almost 3000k but yeah so like 
I think the main difference with the Silverton Collective show, it's very Mad Max 2 centric. Like uh-huh. Adrian is absolutely all about Mad Max 2. That's where it was shot. Um, he's hesitant to embrace anything past that. Like uh, I, I probably, sh- now nah, fuck it, Adrian. You hate fucking Thunderdome. That's that's just how it is, and you probably hate Fury Road. And uh, whereas I love all the films, and I'm absolutely, absolutely throffing on Furiosa coming out. I cannot. Wait. Oh my gosh! Same. I am in George Miller's. George Miller has me completely. Yeah. And um, it's really unfortunate that, that a Byron Kennedy passed, and things changed a little bit after that. And I'm well aware of that. But uh-huh. uh huh. I'm. Firmly in George's grip, and I'm ready for the ride wherever he wants yep. to take me with the post-apocalyptic genre. So, um, so yeah, Silverton, the Silverton show is stuck in that spot, and it's amazing because they've rebuilt the compound on the Camel Farm out there. And uh-huh. They had people that worked on the original set helping to design and recreate that. Oh, wow, that's and cool. Spot. And this year, V2A are coming over as well. That's that right, show. yeah. So it's going to amp up a bit, and um, they're really keen to meet me as well and have some talks nice. about the potential of getting involved in pops clips. Yeah, so, fantastic. Um, uh, they put on an amazing show. I mean, every every year they play Wasteland, it is absolutely insane. Yeah. I, well, I can't wait to meet them. I, I, I've been, I mean, they spam the shit out of my everything. So, like, I'm, <laughs> I'm well into what B2A are doing. They are but, um, really good. They are very good marketers, that's for yeah. sure. <laughs> back, back to the Carney conversation, like, they're definitely one of us, you know what I mean? So, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, meeting Steve was a big a big deal, and just becoming really really good friends. And I'm extremely appreciative of knowing someone that's probably more obsessed than I am in a way. You know, like yeah, yeah. Well, there's cool. there's a lot to say about Steve Scholes, and I won't go into all of it. But it's just that he's he's an amazing human, and um, awesome. yeah, really glad that I met him and got involved in the silver and stuff. Yeah, it's a really cool thing to have. Is just you know someone dedicated to like you know, keeping the, the story and the, the Mad Max world alive in that way of like collecting all those things and creating a space where it can be celebrated like that. Yeah. We went to, um, we went there last time cause they do a little tour of all the filming locations when you're at the Silver yeah. show. And, um, we stopped at the, it's kind of like a, uh, a creek bed type thing where they launched the car off the cliff, the, the interceptor. In oh the yeah. Too. <laughs> and um, it, it was kind of like I haven't seen the um, the what's the the, the documentary about uh, Adrian, the uh, archaeologist of the wasteland. Oh. I haven't seen that yet, but I'm gonna no, uh, neither I've have got, I. I've got my hands on that. I will probably show it at Pox Clips uh, next year, but uh, this year, sorry. But um, he took us to that location, right? And so we're going over the rocks and they were telling us where they launched it, how they built the ramp and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. We were, there was a group of us, it was probably about 15, and we're walking through the creek bed and stuff and Adrian scoured over this creek bed like hundreds of times and he's got the stuff out of there, like the bits of fiberglass, you know, wheel arches and things and he's got them in his museum. Yeah. And this um, lady, do you remember her name, Tyranny, that lady that we met at the pub? She oh, Gina. Come down, it'll probably, Gina, was it Gina? And, and so we just walk around this creek bed and Gina picks up this piece of black fiberglass stuff. Jazz, sorry, and, it was um, jazz. It was jazz, it was jazz. And jazz is like, oh, I found something here, what's this? And Steve like almost fell to his knees. Like it was a holy grail item. It was a piece of the wheel arch from the interceptor and it was still oh, wow. down in the creek bed and they've scouted it no all the time. He thought that maybe the because we just had water run through there, like it was a flood yeah. in that area at the time and it was unearthed in the creek bed. And um, she's the like, true Steve. Irony and Steve's being... just like, Steve was having a true... down. Anyway, <laughs> Jazz took it to Adrian to show him. And he goes, yeah, it's part of the wheel arch off the interceptor. And um, and they were all blown away. And Jazz ended up gifting it to Steve. And Steve was, because like it didn't, cool. to her, it didn't mean a hell of a lot. But like, and she Steve wasn't was a Mad like, Max fan. Away. She was just driving through per chance on that weekend. So Amongst huh. you know, 20, 20 people out there searching, the one Mad Max non fan found a piece of the intercept. <laughs> Hilarious. That is funny. That is funny. Wow. Well, cool. Yeah, I imagine that there's lots of uh, George Miller wreckage throughout the uh, the desert there. A lot of it's been he... sort of, you know, 
picked out by people looking for yeah. that kind of thing. But this of course. particular piece, I mean, we went out to the, they call it the, um, uh, the um, pinnacles where they actually built the uh, compound in Mad Max uh-huh. 2. And oh, everyone yeah. was scouring the ground for shit out there, you know, like just mm. looking around. Someone actually found one of the studs, the, the, the square studs off the underwear of one of the bad cops. What? On, on the That's ground funny. out there. And was like, oh, I found this weird little thing. And Steve's like, holy shit, I think that's off the underwear of, uh, you know, one of the bad cops. In it. And so he, they took it to Adrian and Adrian yeah. had the underwear in a fucking case on the wall with no. the exact same studs on it. <laughs> I thought you were going to say it had a missing stud and he just like put that right had, back where it goes. It had several missing studs. But, you know, that, <laughs> okay. was, that was one of the studs off one of the pairs of underwear off one of the bad nice. cops. And um, then... Uh, Tyranny found, because they blew it up, obviously, and it was all built out of yeah. it. And Tyranny found this beautiful There's like a, aged a diode bolt. in here. Oh, sorry, the bolt as well. Quite and so, weird. but yeah. I wasn't looking. I couldn't really be bothered, you know. And um, But Tyranny yeah. found this bolt and gave it, gifted it to me, and I uh, put it on a, a piece of leather. You know, oh, cool. And um, stuff like that. So, yeah, there's, there's shit still lying around out there, but you got to really scour the place for it. No, well, that's, yeah, that yeah, that site that's, was that's deemed a mining lease and then given back to the indigenous people afterwards. So you, it's very, it's been hard to access um, since the movie. Yeah. So there are still bits and pieces out there. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. Don't don't try to access it for people at home. Do not try to access that area if you're not with the Silver Collective or someone mm. organising a tour of some sort. It's locked off. But um, beautiful oh, place and like. When you're up on the the hill, you know that Max is in scouring the compound yep. out because it's all sort of um, accurate geographically to the film. Uh-huh. But um, you you see everything there, like uh, where where the car was parked, where the rock rock was, oh, where he was cool. sitting. With, but it's all there. And yeah, that's one of the fun things about desert landscapes is they don't change much over time. It just takes a lot longer for the landscape to shift uh, and there's no trees to hide anything and stuff like that. So yeah, it kind yeah. of just stays, which is wild. Yeah, you, can, you can still see the scar on the ground from where they had the compound because they dug a big trench around the outside of it. So when you're up on the hill, right. you can actually see the, the <gasps> scar. Oh, that's wild. Has, uh, was Australia, were Australians really excited to get um, Mad Max filming in the country again? Because I know for Fury Road, they, they shot a lot in Africa, but they brought a lot of the production back to Australia for the for um, Furiosa, isn't that yeah, right? Yeah, you know the story behind that. I was just telling these guys about that one. but um, um, I don't know the full story. Uh, well, they, they were ready to go and film in Broken Hill in that, that area. Uh-huh. And then, because and Fury Road was in production for a very, very long time. And right. they were ready to, the, to pull the trigger and it uh, rained and... Uh, when it rains out here, everything goes very green, and mm. so then they had to uproot production and send it to Namibia. So, oh, that's right, that's right. Yeah, because it was all flowering and green and grassy, and we can't very- have a Mad Max post-apocalypse if it's green, unless it's Mad Max One, in which case, green away. Oh, it looks like there's <laughs> going to be a fair amount of green in Furiosa. Is <laughs> oh yeah, because they because we're actually going to have the green place. Before yes. it turns into the mud bugs or whatever they call them. There's a snippet of it in the trailer and it looks like the Garden of Eden. Yeah, right, right. A lot of bear yeah. going on. Yeah, I was I was super excited to see the um, the trailer come out. I, it got a lot of criticism right away for like, you know, unfinished special effects, maybe too many special effects, um, being maybe a little too saturated. I was digging every second of it. And for the few effects that like weren't polished, I did not care. I thought it looked great and was very intriguing. Like I cannot wait to hear this story. I'm like I said, I'm I'm buckled in, I'm ready. I'm going. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait. I think I'm gonna probably have to watch the I'm gonna have to go to Perth, aren't I? I have tyranny and I live remotely. I'm out in the desert myself. So it's coming out I'm of my birthday. So yes you are. We're gonna have to have a bit of a celebration around that. May twenty fourth. Yeah. That's cool. I think we should go to a cinema and just book into every session for like two days. <laughs> <laughs> the pub let's take over yeah i like that yeah so um storm i haven't heard from you in a little bit so i got a question for you which is right. um I, my impression was that you went to the first pox eclipse more as a punter uh than as uh an organizer um what was it like to show up to the festival for the first time 
I I didn't get to go to the first one, unfortunately. I just missed it because um, I was away. Let me rephrase that question. I hear okay. that you missed the first one. Yes, yes, <laughs> you hear right. And you, and you finally get to put, go to the, to the second box eclipse. What was it? <laughs> what was it like showing up to the festival for the first time? Uh, it was really cool. Like I didn't I didn't really know what to expect. I had mates who went the first year. Um, and uh-huh. they were really excited. They like told me I needed to go. Um, and it was a lot of lead up for me. Um, cause I, uh, I ended up building a car for it. Like I specifically redid a car just to be like a pox, a, po- a pox eclipse car. Um, that very is fantastic. Match. And I know it's no small undertaking, no matter what vehicle you're working on. It's no. a lot of work. And it was, it was an old bug that was sitting in someone's paddock for like, a year so it was rained out and rusted and shitty perfect Um, perfect and so we we pretty much like it was he sold it to us being like oh you just need to replace the spark plugs and then like the further (laughs) we went the the more gunk there was and eventually like we had to split the engine and redo everything and redo the body but it came out really beautiful um and so i rolled up with that like i was excited i the, the last month was just spent like just trying to get everything on the car and then the last day packing was just horrific because we ended up having we brought two cars as well as like a full camp kitchen um because my mom ended up running uh like a full restaurant food very nice food setup yeah (laughs) she sold Uh food um (laughs) (laughs) uh, mainly we sold slushies because it was hot as hell um oh nice yeah yeah, so it was really cool. Like, we rocked up. It was a big trek because we ended up coming with, like, a caravan of, like, three vehicles. Um, and we were hauling everything we could get our hands on at that point. Like, we were we were helping a bunch of the – because we were in the Red City, which is a bunch of LARPers out here uh, that basically started that. And so they had a bunch of stuff that they needed carted up to build the red city so like the last day right before packing they came up and they were like oh could you just chuck in like all this corrugated like just find a space for it and like the last week we were building camp signs and stuff we were dying and then driving up it was just beautiful like it was it was a really cool experience to just get to the middle of nowhere and be like all right put your tent down here's where we're staying like that's it and the first 10 minutes I had my car down, I was like, no, 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 we got to get this started. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it was really awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Um, all right. So I'm going to take a quick break. We're going to go to a quick commercial. And then when we come back, I want to hear more about um, how far you guys take LARP at Pox Eclipse, because <laughs> I'm super curious. All right. We'll be right back. Oh, these are the right people to talk to about it. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hey Survivors, Makeshift here with some very exciting news to share. To show our appreciation for our Patreon supporters who make all of the Apocalypse Post's content possible, we're going to be starting a Patch of the Month Club for everyone that's in our Outlander tier and above. We'll be featuring original and exclusive designs from the Apocalypse Post and the Greater Wastelander community. Members that sign up before New Year's Eve 2023 will be included in our first mail-out in January of 2024. And if you want to donate some patches to the cause, you'll become our featured tribe, business, or survivor of the month that your patch is selected. So sign up at patreon.com slash theapocalypsepost and reach out directly at theapocpost at gmail.com. The Love Bombs provide top-notch outcomes for the most discriminating clients all across the wasteland. When you need executive escort and protection, intelligence analysis, direct action, or other specialized solutions, the Love Bombs provide a bespoke option tailored directly to your needs. Listen to this heartfelt testimonial from one of the Love Bombs' satisfied clients. I hired the love bombs to save my precious pookie pie from them nerf scabs over yonder. They was fixing to turn his poor hide into jerky. Woo! I reckon not a one of those bastards will walk away from this scuffle. <laughs> Goodness gracious, I reckon I ain't ever seen a gun that big. The love bombs will give your enemies a lick and they won't soon forget. 
Yes, the love bombs. They're polite, professional, and have a plan to kill everyone they meet. The love bombs provide complete confidentiality in their free initial consultation. That's right, the initial consultation is absolutely free. Remember, the love bombs. Artillery available. All right, guys, we are back. So you mentioned a little bit of LARP with the Red City, which the Red City comes from uh, Salute of the Jugger. Is that right? I believe so, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and so um, talk to me a little bit about that Pox Eclipse. Is it a LARP? Is it not a LARP? Is it not not a LARP? Because we, we kind of skirt this line at Wasteland a bit. There's a lot of... Um contesting um between that fact mainly from the camps of <laughs> larpers that come and non-larpers who think larping's stupid uh which uh -huh. i get it um <laughs> and, and but i i think there's a bit of it like i i think inherently with with having stuff like festival personas and and pretending you are in the desert, you know, in isolation, especially like that, yeah. you get to a point where you're kind of, you're putting it on a bit, you know, and that's, that's like the base element of LARP is just pretending to be someone yeah. else for a bit. Um, yeah. Whether that is medieval LARP, uh, like we do normally, or post-apocalyptic LARP, um, but mm -hmm. that is, I would never say that at pox eclipse because uh, I don't want to get stabbed um, but you know I think there's some there's some points on both ends <laughs> alright and uh, so what, what's the official take from the festival I mean you break down what LARP means right what's LARP mean makeshift yeah it's live action role play exactly so like you can't get away from it really can you mm -hmm. I mean you got your juggers out there performing for everyone it's live action role play you got people going to the bar and they're in character and they're playing pool with golf clubs and it's again, the character is live action role play and you go to Bodega and it's like the guys are letting loose in a way they don't normally do in life and it's yeah. because you're in this place that you've built to be another place so it's hard to get away from it but when you yeah. talk about live action role play in its pure form it's really live action role play. Like it's you're, you're really into it. Like you're living in a character. This one you're breaking in and out of character all the time. Yeah. And so live action role play is a token given to a particular sect of things that go on, and those uh -huh. people leak into this because they fucking love it and they really help build the fabric of the place <laughs> because they can make the believability more and they're yeah. very much appreciated. But uh -huh. LARP as a word that fits within there probably isn't what it is but it's right. but if you break the if you break LARP down to what it specifically is then it kind of is that in a way sometimes and we right. break it in yeah. and out of character all the time like yeah at the bar and you're having a drink and all your 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 storm or your or your instigator or your this other person that's walked in from the wasteland and then uh -huh. you stop and you talk about who you are and what you're doing at LARP a lot of the time doesn't happen much you know yeah like, you don't break uh, at, a, at an official larp you don't really break character right not often yeah so um it's yeah. definitely more so structured <laughs> and i think um i yeah well i, I went I, also... I had it best described once this is the um, awkward silence whether it... <laughs> <laughs> it's that awful <laughs> conversation. I heard it described really well once that um, this event, Wasteland, and even um, the Burning Man and Blazing Swan events, they're all yeah. long-form improvisations, and I think that's the underlying kind of thing that brings them to and ties them mm. together. You've got different containers with Theme different camp. kind of rules. Um, yeah. But, yeah, it's all that very much an improvisational element to it all. Yeah. yeah, and whereas yes. like when we when we have our we have a medieval LARP here, um, at least between two and four times a year, we have um, one out here in Boddington. Um, and with that, I mean, there's story written, there's stuff that organizers have specifically decided goes on, and there's quests to take and stuff. Whereas with Mad uh, with Pox, it's just kind of whatever, like. You figure it out. Go on your own adventure. <laughs> Explicit outcome where I feel like LARP, there's resolutions and, you know, um, there's exactly. There's, you know, there's every, the quest line of the king and whatever. Like, 
there's stuff that happens that they've written and that they're storytellers. Whereas with this, it's very much, what have you come up with? Like a, a lot of the time, yeah, it's, tell your it's, own story. What are you interested in? Yeah, I know a lot yeah. of. It's very. It's yeah, bit, I know a lot of my time. It's very was spent, free form. Yeah, yeah. A lot of my time was spent in the car as much as I could. Like that was all that happened for me for most of Fox was just trying to get into my car and drive it around as much as possible. (laughs) And that's not what people think of when they think LARP. (laughs) How amazing is the car though? Like once you've got that vehicle and you've loaded your, your, and you've loaded your friends onto it, like you've become part of that world. The car. I got to a point. Yeah. uh, We, we had people that were like going from the red city to the bathroom block, which was about five minute walk at, at worst and like every time someone would be like i'm just going to the bathroom i'd be like get in the car we're going on a bathroom (laughs) run and then we'd speed all the way there and then i'd sit there and then i'd wait and then we'd get in then we'd speed all the way back (laughs) this is a thing storm though what when you start talking about bathrooms with someone like makeshift it's very foreign Uh, i see (laughs) i understand see it's a small room that you go into (laughs) wait a second wait a second what (laughs) What did I miss here? <laughs> well, Steve, I know, it's Steve. very luxurious. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Steve and, and um, Firebird were explaining to me that at Wasteland Weekend we don't get bathrooms and this is like a, you know, a, a thought it was oh, oh, no, we, well, we, like, get, uh, we get the porta-potties. Yeah, we, these guys oh. got showers. Oh, what are they? <laughs> wait, really? Yeah. Tell us about the porta-potties. The oh, wow. got showers. <laughs> which we're, we're, wait, we're, wait, wait. Which we're, we're about this close of take, to taking them away at this point. <laughs> You know, hold, hold on. Wait a second. All right. Do you do you really not know what a porta potty is? Is that, oh, no, is that an American porta blue- Actually, no, we have uh, no, wait, let, back on the porta potty thing. So, like the first year, first year box clips, we had porta potties, right? And um, yeah, we had six porta potties. And then going into box clips this year, we're struggling for cash and everything, and we had yeah. pricing for toilets and. Ollie was actually in Perth, so just remembering this is four hours away. He's in Perth picking up the portal loose. Uh-huh. And then at the last minute, I got the quote through for the, um, the, the, the the good job, you know, the good job with the portal loose. And um, I got the quote in for that, and it was like way over what we paid the year before. And so I called Ollie and I cancelled the portal loose. And I was like, and that, and that doesn't mean people have to go shit in the bush. We have a. To, next to the Abandoned Speedway track, there's a motorcycle club, the Southern Cross Motorcycle Club, and they have very, very good facilities there, which oh, are built okay. to look after 200 people at a motocross event. Oh. And so we pay them for use of those facilities. And so I cancelled the port lose and just said everyone's using those facilities. So oh, these guys have got Rolls-Royce facilities. It's like brick-and-mortar yeah. building, showers, I toilets. got you. Okay, okay. And they still complain about it. Oh. Well, you can't please everyone. You always Wait have to I complain t- about the bathroom. That's part People of it. People are going to be bitches. Part- um, Wait yeah. until I take it away from them. Let's see what happens. Oh, there. What, yeah. Cool. As the event yeah. progresses and we get into the what third will, and fourth where will year, I drive the facilities start to? disappearing and start eroding. Before Going us, away. Like they're doing yeah. away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The same, as the, <laughs> the same thing happened at Blazing Slot. It was like, you guys are abusing the, the, the system and we're taking it all away. So, like, oh, yeah. for, a th- for a three day event, and we've done this plenty of times in the past, like, it's wet wipes and portal loose. Uh huh. It's very immortal. Now- <laughs> Do not become um, addicted to the wet wipes. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness. Uh, yeah, I would say about maybe maybe two thirds of wastelanders are using the porta potties, and then there's a lot of campers and RVs. Uh, I've I've used a camper for quite a while. It makes a big difference, especially when you're trying to shoot video and be on the ball True. all day long. Uh, so, yeah, I have not had to experience the uh, Porta John in a while, which is good. But I do know, I do know, Wastelanders have said that every year it's better and better. The company we've been using is great. They come, they they service them like twice a day. So it's like, you know, these are luxurious Porta Johns. We're, we're, at Blazing Storm one year, someone made a... a, a I'm not sure if you remember Tyranny or if you were there, but there was one year at Blazing Swan where someone went into one of the portaloos and decorated it all with lush um, purple velvet and put photos oh, of nice. prints and stuff all over it. It was a prince toilet. <laughs> and it was so cool to walk into one random toilet and it was all prints. It was uh, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, it was good. Anyway, nice. well, we, we digress. Let's get back yeah, to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, let's talk about porta potties more. Um, <laughs> 
All right, I'm not so sure what if you're the... aware. I'm not sure if you're aware, mate. But in Australia, they don't actually have plumbed like water systems. So everyone's just a portal. Every house is a portal. It's in the backyard. Yep. Yep. We call them a thunderbox. Are you? Are you messing with me? You're yeah. messing with me. Yeah. <laughs> but let's so now, say, but edit that out. Let's just tell everyone in the states yeah. that that's how it is. I well, mean, that, it used well, to funny. be. Are, I'm not even joking. It used to be like that. I mean, it wasn't that long ago. Yeah. We're talking. Like, I believe it. Was it a probably ninety years ago? It was like yeah, all thunder boxes. Yeah. Well, we still have. Um, you know, if you get into the really rural areas. Um, we've definitely got places that still use outhouses. I mean, it's very rare, but it's still definitely a thing. So they're, I would not be surprised. They're great, aren't they? Like, I mean, it's nothing better than sharing your fucking peaceful time on the shitter with a couple of spiders. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've got a few rest stops that still do the, the pit bathroom where, you know, the toilet is just, you know, a lifted space with a open pit underneath. Yeah, and, we got a lot um, of those. Yeah. Yeah, it's always a treat. Oh, <laughs> always a treat. You know, it's um, you. You work on your breath holding skills. During yeah, absolutely. Your visits it, 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 you know. because um, the stretches, the stretches between towns in the Pilbara and uh, up in the. Um, I, my brain has just gone to fucking mush lately. The Kimberley, <laughs> it happens. And it happens. Like places like that where there's not a lot of roadhouses to stop. They have like yeah. stops where you can stop and you can stay there the night and stuff like that. And it's just. Uh-huh. Basically, what you're saying it's a hole in the ground with a building yeah. over the top of it, and yeah. yeah, they and they work on that um, system of bacteria just working its right. magic with the stuff. Yeah. And the bacteria is never that great that it can stop all the pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got someone needs to you know break out the whips and get the bacteria working harder. Yeah. After That's this, funny. we're really right, going to so have when to is have the next poly sex chat. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Up next, gonna have makeshift it. talks about shit for an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> it Literally. Happens. Yeah. Well, maybe you could bring like one symbolic porta potty just so people can have the experience. Just the reminder of like, this is where you go. Yeah. Oh, no, we got yeah. You watch yourself. See, yeah. the thing is, we, we prefer to have portal loose. It's more convenient for everyone. Like Storm was saying, you have to walk like five, six minutes to get to the loose at the site uh-huh. this last year because of the inflation in the price of the draining of the yeah. loos uh-huh. we want to go back to the loos because having like three down near general camping and three up near the main area the uh-huh. way it works out apparently when you're renting loos is it's um 50 to one 50 people to one loo. Yeah. yeah nice and then you get and then and then you get them uh cleaned uh, every couple of days yeah yeah so so like with um we're, we're still talking about fucking shit here should we continue? Yeah, we are. Yeah. So, hey. so, 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 like you install the loose, everyone arrives. It's a three. Last year we did four days. We're going back to three this year because four days was just absolutely exhausting. Uh-huh. Um, a lot of people started leaving on the last day. That might have been my fault. Oh yeah, uh, wasn't the poor loose <laughs> fault. Though, anyway, so like, <laughs> you can, everyone comes in day one, day two drained, then um, day three. Day four, which is like when everyone's leaving and they want to have a shit yeah. before they go, yeah, and then they, just... they get drained and clean, taken away. Yeah, but because we're remote, when the people come in to do this work, it's expensive, like it's exorbitant. Because oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It's like oh wow, there's a festival in town. Let's make bank. You know, there's also like right. I'm not going to blame it completely on them. There's disposal fees and things like that. But council can of help course, us with that. of course, we're, the yeah, council and... are very supportive in Southern Cross. So. Oh, that's good. That's good. How many people were at Pox Eclipse last year or this year? Last year? Uh, In 2023? I reckon the growth wouldn't have been huge between the 22 and 23. I think maybe we probably uh-huh. got another 40 people. Uh-huh. But it, it looked bigger because more people came more organized with more camps and more cars. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when people um, build and- up, it starts to look like a lot more. Yeah, and the thing is, like, so you're talking about f- between 420 and 450 people, and then you get probably, like, 30 locals come through. Yeah. So we're probably up about 470, 480. And then, yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a great size. But then you've got to take into account that we had 20 bands out there. So Yeah. And they're part of the numbers. So if you've got 20 people, um, 20 bands coming, and they say you – 
go, oh, they're generally a four piece band. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, So um, so you got like 100 100 artists. Yeah. You got 100 artists and 350 punters. (laughs) And so when you think about. So when you, if you want to get a little bit of scrap of paper and go, oh, so this is the ticket sales and this is the bands and yeah. there's a deficit with bands because they're getting paid. Right. After you've done your insurances and your medical, because we get St. John's on site and your, and all that stuff, then yeah. there's a deficit. Yeah. Um, and that's where the fundraiser comes in. Mm-hmm. And there's mm-hmm. all the other little bits of shit you got to pay for, you know, like websites and mail checks yeah. and so, which leaks out yeah. during the year, like, like of course, design programs and things like that, which all go on to mm-hmm. the. And then you've got myself, um, Ollie, and Loz, who are sort of like the main organisers, who put a whole bunch of time and their own fuel money and all their own personal money into getting the event happening all throughout the year, and then at the event, and then, and they're not getting reimbursed really, except for stuff which has got a receipt. And then you've got all mm-hmm. our lovely volunteer crew who also put all their time in during the lead up and then on the event site. And then you've got yeah. the, and the volunteers. And so, like, um, it, it's hard, but it's kind of worth it in a weird way. The carny thing. Yeah, well, it's it's kind of like it's kind of like just you know you're throwing a party, and um, you know with the tickets you're asking people to cover a little bit of it, but for the most part, uh, it's expensive. And the thing is, for me, like I love, I love, um, I, I've been living remotely for like five years. Uh-huh. And for me to go to another remote location and then just watch all these fucking fantastic bands, like for me, that uh-huh. that's really like I, the bands are amazing. Like the quality of music that's in Western great. Australia is epic, and like to have those guys out there, and they come because they they don't come because they're getting paid a bunch of money because they're not. They get paid fucking not much at all. Like. But um, they come because they want to be involved in the event. And yeah, so you've got yeah. these bands there that are there for the, the three or four days just loving it, like just right. riding around on motorbikes and running a muck, going over to general camping, have quiet chats, coming back to the event site and partying in the bodega. Yeah. It's just a vibe. It's great. And do the do the bands, do they all have um, a level of theme? Like are they post-apocalyptic? Or? Yeah, they all, come with, they all come with their costumes. Yeah. No, I mean as far as the music, but. Well, it's kind of like. This is the thing, like, when I was going into doing Pox Clips initially, like, because I'm, like, a big industrial guy, you know, like, I love yeah. all the, the 90s industrial stuff, and I really think that fits, but there's no 90s industrial in either Mad Max films. Right. There's a bit of jazz, you know? There's, uh-huh. a, bit, there's a bit of rock and roll. There's a bit uh-huh. of um, referencing to ACDC in the first one. Um, uh-huh. So my logic is that... Wait, isn't it Akadaka? Yeah. ACDC. <laughs> oh, are you talking Australian? <laughs> Fuck me. I was. Oh. I was. Wasn't Fuck it the last that. time we chatted that you, was it you that mentioned Akadaka or am I making that up? No, um, I may have mentioned it because that is a common terminology here, but I didn't think yeah. that, that you got, you, you Yankees say that kind of stuff. No, we certainly, we definitely don't. We definitely, oh, well, I'm, I'm doing my research. <laughs> you're, you're doing, you're doing very well. You actually threw, <laughs> threw me for a six then. But anyway, um, so, so my logic is like, after the fall, what do people play? I mean, Auntie Entity's mm-hmm. up listening to a blind saxophonist. Right. You know, and we have jazz bands out there. Uh-huh. We have folk bands out there. We have cool. metal. We have a lot of metal. And yeah. and like and um sort of alternative rock. And the I mean I don't think any of it is not sort of logical. You know, it's kind of like <laughs> What are people playing in the post? Like you got the Doof yeah. Warrior up there just fucking smashing out some guitar. Oh yeah, like, yeah, he's just wailing. Yeah, and it's um, I mean, as far as lyrics are concerned, what are we looking for in the post-apocalyptic future? Like, are we reminiscing about love, or are we yeah. wanting to be mm. violent and fighty? We, I mm-hmm. think people are looking for all those things. They're looking for yeah. remnants of the past. I mean, we still yeah. get to listen to fucking Bark, right? You know I mean? Right. So like, yeah, there's definitely. There's definitely a wide berth there, right? Yeah, but the thing is the bands come in theme. They come dressed in theme. The stage Uh is in theme. Um, Everyone's dusty as fuck out there and you can't get away from it. And most of them are pretty boozy. So, I mean, it still feels right to me. And and, and that's just me as an event director. But these guys are kind of like, 
the ones that are viewing it from a different perspective and they're probably the better people to talk about it. Oh yeah. So what'd you guys think? Was were the were the bands on point or was it a little did it take you out of it? I I mean for me, yeah, definitely. I mean it brought me into it. It was nice. It was really great. And like even there's some bands I didn't like because people have different tastes. <laughs> Call um, them out. Say them by name. No, no, no. It's fine. No, it's fine. That was um, <laughs> no, it great. But even then, like, having music blasting was, it felt very post-apocalyptic. Like, nothing more. It felt very much like a post-apocalyptic gathering. We all got together, and we're all celebrating and being together and making noise. Yeah, and Being yeah. alive. And... At the end of it, you go home and it's very quiet. <laughs> yeah, it, it changes you for a few weeks, doesn't it? It does. It does. Like ev- like I, most I had to festivals go back to do, my but day job, and I, I was sitting there like, where where's the dust? <laughs> where's yeah, all the noise? Yeah. I'm not used to it. <laughs> we we do a um a playlist after every event as well that has a track from every one of the bands that plays. So. Oh, cool! That's and great. That's on Spotify. So if you look up Pox Clips on Spotify, you can have a listen to. And it is very eclectic. Um, oh, that's and, so fun. Nice. And this year, like 20 bands, which is fucking nuts. Like, yeah, even yeah, for that's me, a good that playlist. Sort of, yeah. And just, just even like, because my, my logic is like, I need five bands a night. Uh huh. You know, four days and it's like 20 bands. And then all of a sudden it's just right. kind of like you're inundated with artists. They're everywhere. Yeah. And it's amazing yeah. to have all those people out there. And, and the fact that they do it, the, the first year Pox clips, like, we, ha- we were on the bones of our ass. Like, we didn't really actually know how we were going to pull it off. So we borrowed, and I think you wanted to get onto that, but we borrowed a lot of stuff to get it do- going and the bands all came out for free. So that's mm-hmm. like 15 bands all coming out for free. If you put that into your calculator, like that's a lot of, like between the volunteers, the organizers and the bands that come out, that's a lot of gifted capital. Of like, course. That's a yeah. shitload of gifted capital. Yeah. And I mean, that makes me kind of proud that, people are that interested in coming to a thing like this. Oh, totally. Totally. But um, then I decided like, I can't do this. It's not really right to not pay these people that are hauling massive amounts of gear and paying for fuel. So I mm-hmm. asked, so we got an application form for bands and we got 25 applications for a gig that needed 20 bands um, last year. And mm-hmm. they get to put their own pricing on it. Cool. And when those forms came back, I was just, so humbled by what they put on those forms, hmm. like absolutely humbled by how much they understood how hard this thing was to get off the ground with the with the mm-hmm. monetary value they put on their performance. Mm-hmm. And I'm in, indebted to those guys. And I, if they ever want to come along again, and if the event does grow, and I can, we can pay them more substantially. That's where it's going to yeah, go. The, yeah. the money will go into those artists to entertain all of us on site. Good. Um, up until- I'm glad to hear that. Cause yeah, there's, I mean, there's gotta be a balance cause you want the bands and you want to be able to, to treat them right. Uh, yeah. But at the same time, you can't afford to pay everyone, you know, what they would get in the city or, or for a bigger concert series, that kind of thing. Yeah. So that Desolation Center, that documentary I um, mentioned earlier. Uh-huh. Um, I, I, I recommend anyone that goes to Wasteland events to watch that. It's amazing. Uh, the whole story. What was that called? Desolation Center? Yeah. And it's about like a punk movement in California. Mm. Um, I believe in the late 70s, early 80s. Early 80s. And they got driven out of town by the cops because the cops would just keep coming in and raiding the punk parties because they just thought right. they were anti-establishment. Uh-huh. But, they, but, but you know, we know punks, right? They're, fairly, they're relatively fucking peaceful people unless you stir them up. Anyway, exactly. so they, they got driven out of the city. Well, they just got hassled so much they decided to start getting school buses and sending people out to the desert and doing the parties out there. And then shit just went off chops. Oh, yeah. Um, nice. Where was I going with this fucking narrative? I don't was, know. But I did I did want to talk to Rouse about a little bit more about the oh, volunteers because as the volunteer coordinator, how many volunteers would you say you had for this past event? Um, so I co-led with um, someone named Jess. So I just wanted to give a shout out to Ultraviolet, who was a great help. Um, and um, we had about 45 active volunteers at the event. 
So, yeah, really, really, again, humbled about, you know, people coming forward and contributing their time, Uh, especially when I was running around like a headless chook and trying to rein people in, you know, maybe I (laughs) misrusted something. Just people were more than happy to kind of stop whatever they were doing and say, hey, I'm free, I'm not doing anything, Mm -hmm. I'd love to help. And um, Cool. With the because we had the bar and the gate, and now with the bank this year fully operational, I feel like they added a real immersive kind of element to it. And what's the bank? So Pugs Eclipse has its own. It's a source of conjecture. Cap, <laughs> cap, cap economy. So instead of using oh, okay. real money, it's a cap system where you can go to the bank and exchange your Australian dollars for a uh, cap to the value of. Two dollars fifty and five dollars, um, and then you go spend those at the bars or uh, vendors. Oh, very cool! Such as those at the Red City, and then they can go back. The vendors can then go back afterwards and yeah. cash in their their um, profits. Oh, very good! Oh, that's fun. So you so you have real value to the caps. That's. I that's really neat, actually, because now you now you've got people with like a bag of caps and they're pulling them out and here's two fifty, here's five bucks. I imagine a beer is five five bucks ish. Yeah, it's five bucks for a beer. And it's seven fifty yeah. for a, a, a sort of a, a primo. Like a what do you call it? Spirits. Kind of yeah. Wait, um yeah. just quickly, I'm gonna jump around like because I've got ADD, right? So I'm gonna jump back. <laughs> yeah, hit me. Desolation Center. <laughs> The reason I was on that narrative is because the first Pox clips that we're doing, I'd, I'd been recommended this film by a good friend of mine, Steve, mm. who's in a band called Inch Ninja. So you guys in the States, you got to check that band out. They're really cool. What's they it called? Like Inch Ninja? I- injured Ninja. Injured. <laughs> ninja. I thought it was just like a little, little tiny ninja. Yeah. Um, miniature Ninja. And so... <laughs> When I was doing the first Pox clips, when I was organizing that, I said, look, I want to just be Desolation Center. And he recommended me that documentary, right? So I'm like, oh, it's going to mm. be like Desolation Center. You guys just put your amps on the ground and we're just going to play and it's like fucking yeah. raw. Yeah. He's like, nah, man, you can't do that. You can't get all these bands to drive seven hours in the desert and just put a fucking amplifier on the ground. That's bullshit. You need to get a stage and do it. And so now the stage at Pox clips, and it was because of your influence, Steve, you motherfucker, because – an exorbitant amount of money. And, and like, I, I was going to mention the amount, but I'm not. But the thing is that the guy that runs that stage, Chad, I love you, um, does such an amazing job and it's a really amazing fucking stage. And we nice. still do it on the cheap, as in the stage is like a semi-trailer truck bed. But yeah. the equipment that he uses and what he does with the mixing and everything is amazing. And oh, it's not, cool. And it's not going to stop. Um, and then fast-forwarding back over the cat bit. Um, yep. We talked about this in our last interview, if anyone wants to go and revisit that from two years ago. But you were asking me about, you were very interested in that because you because it obviously runs very differently to Wasteland. But um, in Australia, it's kind of like a little bit, maybe a grey legal area to just have a party on the size that we are mm-hmm. and have BYO. So mm. there's that factor and also the factor where we don't make a lot of capital through ticket sales and uh, alcohol, selling alcohol legally is a really good source of income. And if we hadn't put that in place this year gone because I paid the bands, we would have been about 8K in debt. Oh, wow. Wow. So having the cap system working in the economy is Mm -hmm. very different and it's hard to manage because we've got to calculate and count all that and distribute it. Right. The cap economy works across not only our facilities but other people's facilities so storm's uh, mum parents for example run a um, food outlet and we need that food outlet because in australia you have Mm -hmm. to have food with alcohol if you're selling alcohol okay and they collect all the caps so if they're selling a food item for five dollars it all goes into a bucket comes back to it it gets counted and then we pay them Uh uh-huh so it's that kind of weird material economy that's going on there yeah gotcha Gotcha. And that so makes the, cap, sense. the caps are all produced and very, very hard to replicate. And mm-hmm. we have thousands of these things at this point. And going into the next year, like, so what we did the first year, we only had $5 caps and we have feedback forms after the event. So people tell us what they think 
could yeah. and, would, and should change. And we had a lot of feedback from the first year saying we need two dollar fifty caps. We want to have a smaller currency. And so mm-hmm. we grabbed the cats from the original year, shifted them down from $5 to $2.50, put new cats into place of $5 and mm-hmm. then built on that economy. And now those cats will end up in redundancy and um, not all of them. I might downgrade one and then make another currency at like a dollar or something so that people can mm-hmm. trade stuff cheaper around that. Yeah, yeah. So then you can go like, you know, um, $8.50 for an item or whatever. Right. Um, so I might downgrade one of those currencies back down into a, uh, a smaller format and then get rid of one and then add two more, which means we've got, <laughs> <laughs> but then that means I we've see. got thousands of leftover caps with pox eclipse on them, which I then want to mail out and distribute to apocalyptic events worldwide so that they can. Oh, very them. cool. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, just as gifts. I'm starting to figure out why you need a bank because it sounds <laughs> like it can get quite complicated. <laughs> yeah. So it is complicated, but it's something that, where we're at is kind of like required on multiple levels. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and and it makes it very fun. Like I've had <laughs> people say, hey, just do FPOS facilities all over site and you don't have to worry about that shit. And I'm like, I'm not going to fucking do that because I'm not even going to tell you who said that tyranny. But like I think just having, so you go to the bank, which is like this little, little building that's sort of on the entrance way and you come it's like okay. a tin, tin shack and you go in there and you've got you got your card and you don't have to carry your card all the time you can just tap that thing and get like hundred dollars worth of caps put them in your pocket and put that card away for the next couple of days oh very nice yeah and you walk around the site and you can go get your slushy or you like Pete, what was shay selling can someone tell me what shay was selling queefs or something what so was someone on site selling queefs <laughs> Wait, I'll are you, give, saying, I'll, I'll are you saying you a, queefs? Yeah, you can queefs. commodify anything in the right <laughs> I'll queef. How do you, like, like, here's, I'll a, here's queef, a bottle I'll of queef. queef. You, I'll queef for you for a cat, you know? Like, on demand. Oh. Queef for, queef for oh. a cat. That's amazing. Yeah. All right. If, if, if that's completely, I mean, it was something like that. I'm pretty sure it was a queef. I'll queef on demand for a cat. And so we've got people running around making money just doing weird physical um, <laughs> like extreme sports and well that's so, an um, economy i can get behind yeah and so and, and the thing is like that is all part of the you know firebird he loves to talk about economy so one day firebird's going to have to go around and interview all these people that are doing weird things on site for the economy you know because you're just selling it for wear and then it just goes back into the system it all sort of works out in the end hopefully i don't know i've done the math I did want to say, as like a, <laughs> as a purely non-organizational person, um, in that regard, in your regard, um, it did definitely. The caps were amazing. It was so much more mm. immersive. Immersive, yeah, yeah. It, it had nice. such a good feeling to it to be able to run around with your little handful of caps. And th- there it's was nice to have a jingle. We were, yeah. Exactly. We were at one point because we were trying to sell slushies um, to people to make money. Um, so we'd go around with slushies and there's just something about like being handed a bunch of caps and just going, yes, um, that was just <laughs> amazing. That wouldn't have been the same if it had been like a note or if we'd had an F pocket. Yeah. There was just something yeah. about a horde of little caps that was just, oh, <laughs> so good. I would imagine. I would imagine that having the cap economy would actually encourage some spending too and like help out your vendors, right? Very hard to budget with caps. I think I, I think so. It's a... <laughs> oh, it's my cap budget. Well, I've got a pocket full, so I must be rich. It, it's like it's the same. It's the same. Any, anything you go, it doesn't matter if you're using your card or cats or cash or whatever. It, as soon as you get drunk, it's just like fucking. <laughs> let, let's get rid of it. I had a, I had a can oh, yeah. the first year that didn't even. Anyway, I shouldn't really. Talk. Basically, it was a camp that didn't have any services or aware of it. They came with a bucket of caps back to me, like at the uh, end of the event. Oh, and they wanted to cash yeah. out and you were like, what'd you guys sell? Yeah, but then Wait. I just rolled my eyes and gave them their fucking money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was that was that the Queef Camp? <laughs> uh, we, won't, we won't explore that story too much, but anyway, I had a fair That's idea. Funny. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole world is like some bad dream you can't wake up from, isn't it? Don't you feel that way too, sister? 
Now why wouldn't you? The world is a wasteland littered with ghouls and toe cutters. But it doesn't have to be. Instead of a nightmare, wouldn't you like a dream, brother? Well, now you can have it. And in such an easy little package. That's right. I'm talking about Jet, friend. What's Jet? Why, it's a little inhaler that packs a big kick. Boy, does it. Jet will give you such a rush that you'll think you're flying up above the clouds. Maybe even develop the sight and really turn your life around. But only if you get the genuine article, pal. The only authentic Jet around is brewed, packaged, and distributed by the Boneyard Buzzards. Through rigorous testing and the death of only one faction leader, the Buzzards have honed a recipe that's safe for consumption and recreation. So if you want to live a dream, get Jet. And if you get Jet, get Buzzards Jet. Anything else is a trip to an early grave. And that's a fact, Jack. Jet is a fictional narcotic and is for entertainment purposes only. So what's the next question? What is the next question? I don't know. Uh <laughs> All right, so um, yeah, with uh, with Furiosa coming out, are you guys going to try to like incorporate some new, some new Mad Max themes into the event? But George Miller's coming over in a red cape. That's nice. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> I think Wasteland's been secretly hoping he would just show up for you know over a decade now. To to, um, to be quite frank, I have been in communication with Kennedy Miller for the last few years about doing something, but oh, cool. The feedback I get from admin is that George is extremely busy and I'm hoping that's slowing down a little bit now because I do know that Wasteland did a thing. I actually researched Wasteland quite heavily. Like there's these uh -huh. videos online where they'll just film the event for six hours and it's just a sta static camera uh, gee, on the street. Gee, and I'll just, I'll gee I wonder who does that. There's this fucking weirdo <laughs> over there, this fucking weird fucker that will just set up a camera on the street. And just leave it there. Just, yeah. And I'll actually yeah. sit there and watch it and go, oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, that, would, that person's wearing plain clothes. What the fuck's going with that? Yeah. And things like that. But, um, yeah. And then there's, there, there, there is a, I think, I don't know, maybe Wasteland Weekend third year or something. And no, was it the, it was one of them. Anyway, you can tell me makeshift, but George did a video for the event. What did we do? Um, George George filmed a sort of yeah, a, a video yeah. for the event to say, oh, it's great to see that this is a thing and blah, blah, blah. And that video I've heard about but never seen because I reckon Justin I or someone's just sitting on it. I don't know if I've seen it because yeah. we, um, we went to a Mad Max screening in Santa Monica and a bunch of Wastelanders showed up and I had a camera there and George was there for the screening. Like, I think he did a quick Q&A or just a meet and greet okay. and a bunch of the Wastelanders got to meet him. I wonder if it was from something like that, but yeah, I don't cute, think I've seen he? this video. Well, he's very what? He's very cute. <laughs> he is. George he is. is a cute cunt. Let's just be yeah. real about it. Yeah. He's cute. Especially yeah. when he's his little chili. He's got shirts with little chilies down the front. <laughs> He's a he's a dapper fellow. I just want to squeeze yeah. his little cheeks. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just he he just looks like you know you want to have a beer with them, except it would probably be a light beer um, or a sour. I could see George being a sour drinker. I'm a sour drinker. So I reckon he's into the, the white. Oh. I reckon he's a white wine kind of guy. <laughs> I, Maybe. I could believe that too. Yeah. White wine and cocaine. Just a little <laughs> sniff. <laughs> Gross. A little spoon around oh his neck. <laughs> Georgia, for some strange reason, you're listening to this. I apologize. But, um, George, but yeah. you love all, me. Send all me some really, letters. <laughs> all, all we this want is, is what your drink. fan base looks like. <laughs> <laughs> you, Look what you've, you've done created to us. This. You've Years done of this. abuse. It's your fault. <laughs> this is all your fault. I'm broke because of you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, every single year we do, um, we do the, the, uh, the group photo at Wasteland at the main gates. And uh, almost inevitably, we do a big thank you, George, uh, with everybody screaming, thank you, George Miller. That's uh, weird. It, yeah, it's it's just because why, why not? We get weird. I mean, if that's the weirdest thing that gets out there, then we're doing pretty good. Cause... So so on the weird stuff, like at um, <laughs> Wasteland Weekend, is there much nudity? There is. There is. A, I mean... I wouldn't say there's a lot. There is some. Um, yeah. uh, you know, you'll just see someone riding around in a car, just topless or sometimes completely naked. Like humongous um, at standard, right? 
kind of right. Um, the pool it's, guy. it's not encouraged and it's not discouraged. It might be lightly might it might be slightly more discouraged than encouraged that way. Oh, we encourage um, it. Yeah. Oh, I mean, uh, I mean, the thing is that if people want to express themselves and coming from like a burner background, they're more, yeah. more than welcome to do so. Yeah. And the thing is, with nudity, with being involved in burner communities and just weird shit for a really long time, it's uh-huh. just you don't even see it. But right. the local, the locals do, of and they make it very well <laughs> yeah. known to me. Yeah. Hey, what's we that saw that? a girl with her tits out. And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good, good work, good job, well done. Yeah. Enjoy. Well, well done for noticing. I hope you're having a good time. Yeah, yeah. We've kind how of got this. Um, <laughs> how about the music? We've got this um, kind of. I don't know if it's a written rule or an un. No, it is actually a written rule that nudity is not a costume. So if you're going to be naked and just be like clean naked walking around, like that's not much of a post-apocalypse costume. It doesn't serve any story points well. It's not um, practical. Meanwhile, if you can incorporate it in into your look well. Um, then Mother's milk. All for Need it. I say more? <laughs> oh God! Fuck you! Went there, man. Don't tell me it's not part of the narrative. <laughs> well, <I> mean, <laughs> mm, good, Dad. Oh, God. <laughs> I just disconnected my headphones. I've I've lost. And I'm control. not even going to go into the nudity in Mad Max Two because that was vicious and one. In which one? Both of them. One oh. and two. There was a lot of nudity. Right hey, fella, that. you're a goose. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you remember all the nudity in Mad Max? I what? There's like a couple little shots. Yeah, is there? A, that's it, right? I I mean, I'm gonna have to go back. Maybe I'm just not shocked by things anymore. But there's not a lot. There's not a lot, and, and generally it was kind of yeah. like it sort of um goes. It goes into the uh, dark psychology side of the first two films. Yeah, yeah. But in, um, I mean, there's nudity and, I mean, there's also sort of a bit of wet sort of T-shirt stuff going on in Fury Road. But right. Like, and that, that happens at Wasteland as well and it's something I want to do at Pox Clips. I wanted to do it um, last year actually, but I um, failed. Because it's like <laughs> I try to organize things and then shit's just going on everywhere and just sort of doesn't oh, happen. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's kind of like with these build-your-own type events, you need other people to manage smaller exercises. Oh, of course, stuff. yeah. You've got to be like, here's the idea. Now you yeah. own this yeah. so that I can yeah. but you know, then, balance. But then the, the, the difficulty is finding someone that's interested in owning it. Of course. And I don't yeah. want to pressure anyone into owning stuff. It's kind of got they got to be like, I want to own this. Or, right. You mentioned yeah. the little thing and they're like, I want to own that. Like you, you can't yeah. just go, hey, I'd really like you to do this and encourage them to the point where you're pressuring them. I'm not that, that right. guy. Yeah, they can't say no. Yeah, and, and I've got this new thing now where it's kind of like I'll ask someone if they're interested in something and then they end up talking to me at length about why they can or can't do it and it's like, hey, it's a simple yes or no. If you're interested, it's like right. yeah. that would be cool. But if you're not, it's cool. Just say no. You're too busy. you got other things on, yeah. mate. And, um, but I, I, I hate to be, I'd hate to be the person that pressures people. I think people need to just be like, oh, you mentioned something. Oh, that's something I'm really into. And then they take it. Right. I'm yeah. not sure. You tell me about Wasteland. How does it work there? Well, it's, it is kind of like that, right? Because we, we do have volunteers. We have hundreds of volunteers by the time it's said and done. Cause the build crew is huge. Um, and, uh. And then, of course, we've got the bar. We've got entertainment. So there's an entire stage crew. There's go-go dancers that are volunteers. Um, we've got security and medical volunteers. I mean, it's it's across the board. And people kind of like figure out what they're interested in. Um, you know, if you don't know what you want to do, it's probably you're going to end up on build crew because that's just where getting bodies that can physically do some things is the most useful. Um but then, yeah, people kind of like gravitate toward their skills. You know, I'm, I'm a filmmaker in the real world, and that's why I've been leading the video crew for this whole time. Um, uh, and let's where, see. Where are, you based, like, where, where are you based normally? Like, Oh, I'm in, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. So I'm oh. halfway across, well, a little bit more than halfway across the country from from, Nash, from uh, Wasteland now. But I used to be in L.A., so it was two hours away. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely been a big difference logistically because – uh, now to get a camper out there, I've got a road trip and that takes three or four days. And then 
I'm there for at least a week, sometimes more. And, and, that, then, and, that's, um, and that's the thing with it, like when you talk about building these kinds of events and the logistics side of it and being yeah. someone like myself or uh, it's Justin, isn't it? It's Justin, I got that right? Who's, Justin who's who? running um, the... Oh, Jared. Runway? Jared. Jared. Jared, Jared yeah. yeah. Um, so Jared... Jared's been doing this for a while and now he's sitting on this event, which is very large. Yes. And when I go, oh, look, I'm doing this thing on a small scale and it's hard to manage. Mm -hmm. Like you've really got to admire someone like Jared that can hold all that shit together. And and he's probably had an amount of time where he can put soldiers in place underneath him to. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. For like when he definitely works with department heads. Yeah, and it kind of like you know, pyramid schemes its way down. It's you know, there's definitely a uh, uh, a management uh, lineage that happens. Yeah, and that and that happens. I mean, like tyranny has been extremely important in what we're doing, and yeah, he's he's been with me for a very long time from the Church of Belligerents up through this, and like mm-hmm. it's definitely like one of my main soldiers, and then. You know, you got Loz and Ollie who are absolutely selfless when it comes to this kind of stuff. Yeah. And but the thing is, I think they feel and they are part of it. Like, yeah, yeah. you've got the you've got the concept, and they're part of that. And then right. just because they they've got that extreme passion and interest, mm-hmm. and then you hope that as it filters down and numbers grow, you get the same amount of interest from other people right. coming up, and yeah. so. So Jess Schwending is one of them, like jumped on board and was super enthusiastic about having a camp the first year. Mm-hmm. And then now is like, looks like to be in the burning world. Like they call them rangers, you know, like people that look after the people. Right. And, yeah. um, and, and she's really stepped up into that role. Cool. You know, she has like a lot of um, experience in caring for people. and Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think that happens is is you you go and then you say oh, I want to get a little bit more involved and then and then you go again and you now you do a thing uh, and then you just keep doing that thing and making it better and and as people like you know grow something you find more and more people to kind of that that that's what they're into you know like um, for me one of the one of the things that I've brought is some live entertainment whether it's some it's like a side stage music or we do um, a, a roast that's actually we schedule before the event even begins so that we can be a little bit more open uh, <laughs> because it's a little bit more just, just for closer friends. Um, and that's something like, you know, if people are into it, they're going to grab on. They're going to say, Hey, uh, let me help. You know, how can I get more involved in this? And then you say, you know, here's, here's the guidelines go. Yeah. And that's what, that's what really builds the the township or the theme is that right. there's many, many people bringing little concepts because I enjoy giving. Exactly. Um, the yeah, I mean, that's really where the, that. yeah, and that's where all the theme camps come from is people just say, hey, I want to make a cool thing. Yeah. And then they find a bunch of their friends and, hey, let's do a build day. Let's make a let's make a thing. We had this guy, Adam, who's also a longtime friend, like we've been to Burns and stuff, and he'd come out um, uh-huh. last year and he'd made like this cool post-apocalyptic like trike. And on the back of it was like a barbecue. And he would just roll up to the <laughs> I main think I saw stage. pictures of that. He just roll up the main stage or wherever, wherever there was people gathered. He'd roll up there and just start cooking sausage. <laughs> I love it. And so you sit there with your beer, and all of a sudden these guys just rocked up with sausage, and you're sitting there eating sausage and drinking. And it's like that sh- kind of shit. Like when you're just in the dark, like yeah. having a t- chat, and someone rocks up with hot food like that. It's just you know, it just is an important. It's a really good way of connecting, and like brings more people together and. Like we'd yeah. be at the bank working, like I'd go and help on the bank every now and then, like in, and like I would add him a rock up with sausage, you know, and he's kind of like feeding the the workers as well. And we actually had a guy on site build a car in three days this year. Oh, really? Yeah, because we set up a, the Black Thumb Quarter now has like a a, a, t- a big tent, which is actually from the LARP community. They lend us that. Going back yeah. to what you originally want to talk about with lending things, but. Um, <laughs> And so that's a garage and yeah. guys with cars can go under there and work on their cars. But this guy bought a, a Charger. So in Australia, there's a Charger by Chrysler, but which is completely different from the Charger you guys had in America. And oh, gotcha. I believe it's a 
seven it's just mid 70s i think the charges and then they yeah. had like regals and you know valiant's regals in in america uh-huh. the valiant the one that you saw in jewel that was uh-huh. like so so those kinds of body panels came over to australia and they started building them here and calling them different things okay so that that valiant which was a cry it's fucking very confusing anyway you're gonna have to look it yeah up. but um yeah. so you mean australians then, uh come up with funny names for things go on oh they do <laughs> They do. My favorite one, I own a we, what, Subaru Brumby, and you guys refer to them as Brats, which I quite love. <laughs> and, and to us, Brats is a fucking doll with a weird high school costume on or something. Oh, yeah, the Brats doll. That's funny. Yeah. But the Brats, I remember those. Yeah, so Firebird came over and saw Tyranny's Brumby and was like, oh, that's a Brats. And in America, they used to mount seats on the back so that you could have four passengers. Oh, my God. And so now Tyranny's got... Uh, seats on the back of his and he's put a taxi sign on the top of it and drives that around there. Oh, heck yeah. The, um, Wasteland taxi the waste Fantastic. Yeah. But, nice. um, so the Charger in Australia is more of a compact thing. It was very sporty. It had a 265 Hemi in it, which is probably unfamiliar in the States as well because Hemis in the States are all V8s, but the hemispherical right. head, they kind of like made a shitty job of it in Australia and sold it in six-cylinder format. And um, okay. so he got a, a Regal, like a Chrysler Regal, around the same year, which would have been a Ford also then. And he drove, uh-huh. well, he didn't drive it out. It wasn't even working. Had a 245 in it, I think, six-cylinder. And he bought it out there with the rear end of a Charger, which he found in the bush somewhere, just a half-cut <laughs> car. And he had the half-cut car sitting there and he had this Chrysler Regal with a non-functioning motor and he pulled it up in this tent. And on the first day, he got the motor running. He took it for a burn around the speedway track. He parked it in the black thumb quarter and he chopped the roof off. He wanted to make a convertible. So he chopped the roof <laughs> off. And he drove it around in the car parade that day. Just the, after he shot the roof off, he just drove it in the car parade and he parked it up. And we were taking photos at the main gate for the parade ending thing. And then he goes, like, he was just ready to go. Like, he was at this fucking photo shoot going, I've got to take the car, I've got to go do some work. Okay, cool. So he took the fucking car, drove over there and he chopped it straight in half with a fucking nine-inch angle grinder. And then he got, like, there's drive shaft and everything, right? So he's just chopped the whole thing in half, separated it, and he got the charger rear end and oh he married gosh. it up to the front of this fucking... Chrysler with the running motor in it. They built this weird carburetor with a fucking beer can induction <laughs> system. Married it up, welded it up, and he had all that done by the second day, or the third day. The fourth day, he was had to shorten the drive shaft, marry all that up. He put like it, bigger springs on the back, so it was all jacked up at the back. Yeah. Did it, got it all running on the fourth night, and so Kevin, the guy that was doing this. Shit, he did a lot of it. I would be driving past it. A lot of it he was doing himself. Every now and then a few people would rock in and help him. And I was working the bank on the last night and I was thinking, oh, I wonder how Kev's going with that car. So I walked over there. There was eight people gathered around it and they'd all been helping him for the last few hours and he got it right. Uh-huh. And he was so fucking excited. He started the fucking thing up and he started reversing it out of the stretch tent and like ran straight into the star picket holding the thing up. Oh, no. And I'm like, Kev, Kev, stop, stop. And I just got there just in time to see this guy fire this thing up. It was absolutely magical to me. Whoa, cool. Go forward, mate, go forward. So he drives forward, blah, 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 and then he fucking reverses it back, comes out, and he did a big victory lap around the entire site and then parked it up on nice. the main stage. And, oh, and, and to be extremely honest with you, I was extremely emotional about that thing. Like the, the, the fact that this guy did all that work in four days and got this thing built, and it, it's uh-huh. the most amazing-looking machine. Yeah, and, um, yeah, 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 and um, you know, for an event on its second official year, like to have someone that is that obsessed, like he's an obsessive. Uh-huh. He's got a museum yeah. at his house. He's got a Mad Max museum set up at his house, <laughs> and he's bringing a semi trailer over to the Silverton show in March with um, because he's got two interceptors. He's got a Mad Max two uh-huh. interceptor, a Mad Max one interceptor, and he's built this other thing. Um, he's working on a big bopper, um, in his, uh, big bopper pursuit vehicle at the moment. And um, he's taken my Ute over as well. So we're going a big convoy with a, f- a bunch of us from the Pox Clips thing to Silverton in March. But, like, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weird how these movies affect people, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I was just thinking about that because uh, we actually have a Black Thumb tribe at Wasteland as well. And a few years ago, I think 2017, maybe 2018, mm-hmm. um, they did that same thing where they took the chassis of one car, an engine of another, and the body of another, and they made a car. It was about six or 10 people 
um, all put it together and had it running by the end of the festival, which is really cool. But to take that a little bit further, I think that, you know, this style of festival where it's immersive by everyone has to wear costumes. But other than that, you can LARP or not. You can volunteer. You can go as a punta. Right. Um, uh, or you can you can run a tribe, you can kind of create your own job, you can create your own business, whether it's, you know, for actual dollars or just for fun. Um, there's so many different things you can do. And it really lets people kind of, you know, make the festival whatever they want. And I think that's really cool, because all of the post apocalypse festivals, other than the actual like, like the zombie LARPs and that kind of thing, they all do this same style of make it what you want, just be in costume and have a good time. Uh, and I just think that's really cool. It's a really, really neat uh, community um, to kind of like keep this same thing going no matter what country it's in. It's pretty rad. It is very it feels rad. a bit I like, mean, like the whole idea about pyramids, like that they just kept building them the same everywhere. It's that kind of like everywhere mm-hmm. you go, it's going to look like that. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a really good point. Yeah, like people can have the same idea simultaneously, and and you know because we live in this modern world where we actually get to see pictures and videos of each other's things and communicate like we are, um, everyone gets to share what's working and what's not working, um, even if it's vicariously. And it's it's really cool because it's just creating this really fun um, uh, subculture that's become its own thing, which is great. It is, and it's kind of like. You're sort of building, like, I don't, being in a Mad Max of Obsessive, being at Pox Clips doesn't, we're in that world, but it's a completely different world to Mad Max, you know, in a yeah, sense. right, yeah. But it's the same narrative. It's really interesting. It's it's a great little social experiment. And, and mm-hmm. just the theme itself is like, you know, the end times, what's going to happen? We're going to fucking party. Oh, and yeah. on that, I have to recommend one other thing to you guys in the States. There's this film yeah. that might be a little bit hard for you to find. Okay. Um, smoke them if you got them. Okay. Smoke them, as in E-M, if you've got them. And um, okay. it's an Australian film. It's, a, it's short. I think it runs about 45 minutes. Mm-hmm. But it was made in the early 80s in Australia, and it's about that. This is basically the end of the world and what how Australians yeah. deal with it. Okay. Um, and it's a very, very fun film. And um and and that and Pox Eclipse, like something like Pox Eclipse, where it's sort of like a grassroots event where people are just there having fun and the theme is like, what are we gonna do when the shit yeah. hits the fan? Uh-huh. Like that is a very potent film for me when it comes to that kind of thing. As a filmmaker, you would appreciate it a lot. Okay. All right. I'm going to see if I can track it down, even if I have to do it slightly illegally. You might even find <laughs> it on YouTube these days. I'm not sure. Right. Yeah, that's the thing. I bought um, it on DVD because I wanted to see it in a higher quality. Thing oh, one. cool. Yeah. A DVD, huh? Yeah, you can find it on DVD if you – you might have I to see... open up your search to Australia or something on the um, eBay thing. Yeah, and I see you've got quite a collection of DVDs behind you. You are a – Those are VHS. Uh, hard movie. Are they really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that, yeah, that brings me back to uh, a few shelves I had in my childhood. Well, let's, let's see if I can grab this one and without for, breaking it. Yeah, and for those that can't see it, um, up behind the instigator, there's at least three, four-foot shelves, floor-to-ceiling, full of VHSs. Oh, the original Mad Max. Original Mad Max on VHS. And I was just showing Tyranny and, nice. um, sorry, Rouse about yeah. the storm earlier when I went and saw... Um, <laughs> Went and saw Mad Max at the Greater Union when it first came out. The the um, uh-huh. through, I kept the the actual cups oh. the popcorn bucket. Very nice. You got the popcorn bucket. Heck yeah! Yeah, the popcorn bucket and the this was full of uh, Diet Coke. Oh, nice. Does the popcorn bucket still have that uh, that movie theater smell to it? That's a good. That's a good question. I want to <laughs> no, it smells like cardboard. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's not real butter. That's the trick. Don't use real butter and it won't stick around. <laughs> my um, well, my, partner, my partner got me the uh, Mad Max Doc Martens for Christmas. <gasps> I didn't know those oh, existed. Lucky. Yeah, how, oh, they're gorgeous. They're do you stunning. dare wear them or are they collectors? No, I'm wearing them. Yeah. You've you got to get them dirty. But yeah, Mad Max Doc Martens. But they, yeah. they, they, they did um, – uh, Doc Martens did a collaboration with uh, Warner Brothers – 
I think two months uh-huh. out from Christmas, and they did um, Blade Runner and Mad Max edition shoes. Oh, very cool! And it's actually nice. got like what a lovely day, like embossed into the back part of the, the boot. Well, and, a bunch and the, of... the sigil into the side and everything. Yeah. All right, I listeners, got, if anyone um, was wondering, for, uh, no, I was <laughs> just going to say uh, on non um, the thing. My mum actually for Christmas made me like a whole line of like merch out of the picture of me with Aww. my car at the event. <laughs> Is that a is that a mouse pad? It's a mouse pad, uh, and also a stubby holder <laughs> and a towel. <laughs> oh heck yeah, nice! That's extremely so fucking cute. cute. That's fun. It's how real many nice. how many caps for a mouse pad? Yeah, I think I think a hundred. A hundred. Well, for this one, it's really cool. Five hundred dollars for a mouse pad. Okay, that's fair. For this that's fair. one, it's, it's really cool. It's a nice mouse pad. <laughs> I'm definitely paying five hundred dollars for that mouse pad. Oh yeah. yeah, um, yeah. We're looking at doing other kinds of merch and stuff for the event as nice. well. I think Makeshift is pretty keen to wrap this up because we're going on like an hour. And yeah, months. this is this is about that time. You, you could feel it, huh? You could feel it. All right, before we go, tell me uh, when the next event is and why people should come. Don't come. It's dangerous. <laughs> good sales. Good sales ticket. All right, but when's the next one? 10th, 11th, and 12th of October in 2024. Very nice. Which is a few months after Furiosa. And you guys have a website? www.pox-eclipse.com. Perfect. I think there was a whole thing on some show. I was watching about how you shouldn't put dashes into website addresses, but I don't care. No, Um, it works. It works. Put it in there. It's, It's part of the name. I really don't give a shit if you don't come, to be honest, like, <laughs> because the community is really freaking cool and there's such nice people. There's no reason to come really because the community is way too nice. Um, there's a lot of really great bands representing West Australia and in the future we'll be getting, we have overseas acts like apply and it's just a matter of maybe not this year, I don't think, but we'll see. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's in a town which is isolated from any sorts of events like this and it's kind of really exciting for them. And it brings a lot of capital into that town, which they're really appreciative of. Um, it's only four hours from Perth, which is just a nice little drive. And once you're there, there's a beautiful campsite. It actually is a really beautiful campsite. I'm not even being facetious. Um, and, yeah, really good times, really good people and um really casual vibe it's actually quite relaxing to be honest and then um if you like mad max or film in general or like escapism then it's probably for you but i really don't give a shit if you don't come to be honest (laughs) (laughs) i I understand that vibe because sometimes you're like i like it just the way it is and i don't want it to change or grow too too much or something like that it's not going to if it ever ever hits like 1500 tickets that will be it it'll be chopped off yeah and that's just the way I like it. And that's about the size of uh, Uranium Springs, if you're familiar with that one in Arizona. They're, I know about they're, Uranium they're, Springs. They're, yeah, they're, they're a few hundred over a thousand, and they're at the point where they're just not really interested in growing anymore. Growing? It's- so what I've noticed with growing, and I know you want to wrap this up, but what I've noticed with growing no, is when good. events get over sort of 1,500, you start to get tourists. Mm-hmm. The tourists don't put in the effort that the people that right. are into the event put into. Right. And also your costs start escalating quite a lot, and mm-hmm. it becomes – hard to manage right and it we the way that it is now i'm not i don't think i'm really that interested in growing like the 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 top of it too big and i and I, and the way that it is now works really well we've got a really good system of people going on and nice yeah so 1500 will be it and i know that when tickets are launched if it ever gets to that point that the people that really want to go will get those tickets oh the yeah. tourists won't oh, yeah. get it you know a leg in so yeah that's us. I get it. I get it. All right, cool. Well, Instigator, Storm, Rouseabout, thank you guys so much for coming on and talking about Pox Eclipse today. Thanks thank for having us, man. Oh, I love what you do, Makeshift, and thanks for having us. And your hair looks fabulous, darling. <laughs> so <Thank> good. <laughs> a lot of great hair on the show today. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to touch you guys, it. You guys are awesome. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's sometimes, once your fingers are in there, it gets stuck. Actually, I, I just can I'd be so. doing more of these <laughs> ones. Yeah. yeah. Is that just weird? Right Very way. poofy. No, no. I, I, like I mean, a bag come of on. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a guy with, I'm a guy with curly hair. I'm just like, no, no, touch the hair, please. Pet me. 
<laughs> and I can't wait to catch up with you at Wasteland Weekend. We'll make that happen. Same, yeah. It, when you when you make it over, please, please come. Let me know you're coming so that we can hang out. Yeah, I will. Right. I will. We definitely well, will. sweet guys. I know it's late over there, so y'all have a good night. And um, oh, this is Australia, mate. This is early. Really? <laughs> oh, for what us, we're, all, yeah, we're all on speed. That's why we got oh, no yeah. teeth. Oh, yeah, that, yeah. that explains so much. See, I'm usually a, a very late riser, which is why I was a little bit nervous about waking up today. Uh, and actually, I did I did the time zone math wrong first, and I thought it was going to be 7 a.m., which is why I said, I'll just wake up before the sun, uh, which I did not have to do. It was actually 9 a.m. start, so that was much better. Oh. I think I think that's how I For fucked up last time when I tried to Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But a uh, yibbida yibbida, <laughs> that's all, folks. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's get out of here. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of the Apocalypse Post. Uh, subscribe wherever you're listening and leave a thumbs up or a wonderful comment or review if you can. Uh, and if you enjoyed today's episode, send it to your enemies. And if you hated it, well, send, send it to your it, enemies. Wait, oh, wait, I said it wrong. <laughs> Man, how many times have I said this darn thing and I can't get it right? If you enjoyed today's episode, send it to your friends. And if you hated it, not loved it, send it to your enemies and sell them maybe a hot sausage or a queef on demand. <laughs> and I'll see you all next time, Wastelanders, survivers. Queefs <laughs> are going cheap, baby. Till then, stay alive. <laughs>